Well, Happy New Year. Today we're going to talk about how to improve on classical guitar. I got questions about how to improve on note reading and uh, what setting should you have the metronome to do good tremolo. How do you handle a difficult passage in the overture to Handel's Messiah? So we'll talk about those questions and yours as well. I see in the chat, Happy New Year from Cat in the Bookshelf. Thank you. Uh, Diana Potts, Happy New Year as well. Uh, good to see you. Jonathan Laird says hello. Tony Ganea says Happy New Year. Uh, so glad to have all of you tuning in uh, for how to improve on classical guitar today. So question from Jonathan Laird, he says, although I play piano as well as guitar, uh, my note reading on guitar needs some work. Uh, I can easily and effectively learn new pieces from tab uh, using the standard notation for rhythm notation and for refingering sections. I don't like the way they're notated in the tab. I do have a hard time learning new pieces entirely from standard notation. I think the difficulty is finding the note on the guitar, especially in the right octave. I want to be a well-rounded guitarist. Uh, what exercises or practices would you recommend to improve Improve my skills of reading from standard notation. So good question, Jonathan. A lot of guitarists do struggle with reading from standard notation, uh, but I do think it's a very useful skill. Uh, as you mentioned, it helps uh, with rhythm notation. It helps with uh, being able to play a passage in a different spot on the neck than what tablature might dictate. So I think it's a good skill to develop. Uh, so it sounds like for Jonathan, uh, you, it sounds like you're looking at the notes on the staff and you don't have a problem knowing what letter name you're seeing on the staff. The problem is knowing where that same note is on the guitar and the right octave. So uh, a couple of things I would say. Uh, one is you want to get to know the fretboard of the guitar better. Um, so for example, just finding you know E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, but also in the higher positions, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, G, A, B, C. So playing through scales on the fretboard of the guitar and just getting to know what those letter names are is helpful. Uh, then also correlating, uh, okay, so if I know this is a C, where does that appear on the staff? Uh, one of the things that's a little strange if you're coming from piano notation is the guitar is notated an octave higher than it sounds. So to put it another way, if you look at a note on the staff that's written for classical guitar, the note that you're, you're playing is actually an octave lower. Uh, so in other words, like if you see an A that is uh, maybe written at the uh, ledger line above the treble clef, you're going to play that right here. Well, actually, that's sounding um, the way that the A in the second space of the treble clef would sound if played on piano. So uh, just realize there is an octave difference there. Um, so if you wanted to exactly play the same note as piano or violin or some other instrument, you'd have to take things up an octave. Uh, but usually if you're just looking at uh, classical guitar notation, you don't worry so much about that. So um, just know the octave um, for you know, the way it is indicated on classical guitar. So then, you know, for a given note, you want to find in those different octaves. So like if, if you're playing this A, okay, that same A is here, that same A is here. Or if you're playing a lower A, that same A is here. Or a higher A, that A is here, or here, or here. So finding the different octaves of those particular notes. Um, I would also say it's just useful to practice sight reading. Uh, Jonathan, you said what kind of exercises or things like that. Well, I would say, for example, example there's William Leavitt's Reading Studies for Guitar Positions 1 through 7. Uh, that's from Berkeley Press. Uh, from the Berkeley College of Music in Boston. So William Leavitt is the author, and the name of the book is Reading Studies, Positions 1 through 7, Reading Studies for Guitar. So I think that's a great book, great exercises to, to work your reading up and down the neck. Also, uh, an author named Robert Benedict has some sight reading for the classical guitar books uh, that are very useful. And I just like the Royal Conservatory books. If you've been on the stream very many times, you know I talk about these Royal Conservatory repertoire books. And a lot of times it's helpful just to sight read through pieces that are way easier than stuff you can play. Um, you know, I know Jonathan, for example, you're working on Capriccio Arabe by Tariga, but if you sight read some really, really simple repertoire in the Royal Conservatory book, then it would uh, make it much easier to sight read. So thank you, Jonathan, for that question. I see our hypo there uh, says Happy New Year. And uh, Stephen Leek says Happy New Year. So yeah, great to see you guys here uh, on January 2nd. Uh, 
just our second day in 2023. I'd be curious if you've made a goal for your guitar playing for 2023. Uh, I'd love for you to share that in the chat. Um, you know, some of us, I know, uh, some people make a resolution not to make a resolution. Uh, for me personally, I don't necessarily do what I call New Year's resolutions because <clears throat> I find sometimes when people make resolutions, it's like all or nothing thinking, you know. Uh, so every day of 2023, I'm going to practice four hours a day on my guitar. And then they get like to January 5th and it's like, oh, I didn't practice four hours. I guess I blew the resolution. Well, that's kind of all or nothing thinking. So I would say setting a goal is what I prefer to do. And so, um, you know, for me, a goal that I have is to make sure that I'm posting at least one video a week here on YouTube of my guitar playing. Uh, that's one of my goals that's relevant to guitar playing. So if you have a goal relevant to your guitar playing uh, for 2023, I'd love to have you uh, drop that in the chat. I'd be interested to see that. Also, if you have any questions uh, that you would like me to talk about here in the stream, please do put those in the chat as well. Another question that I got in advance was from Zivi Rothenberg, at what setting does the metronome need to be in order to get a good tremolo? Well, um, obviously he's talking about a target tempo. The simplest answer there would be if you take a piece like Recuerdos de la Alhambra, then you'd need to get to metronome equals quarter or equals eighth equals 152. Uh, so four notes per click at 152 is kind of the target of Recuerdos. Uh, so if I, uh, you know, set my metronome at 152, That's a good target tempo for Recuerdos. Um, in some editions, it'll say quarter equals 76 because it's technically in 3-4, but there are six groups of four notes per measure because each group of four notes, uh, they're actually 32nd notes. So there's four 32nd notes in an eighth note. And so eighth equals 152, quarter equals 76, but usually I'd set the metronome on the eighth note. So uh, I'd have it at 152 with four notes per click. Now, with that said, with any kind of speed goal, you got to start where you are. Uh, so if doing tremolo at 152 seems remote to you, start where you can comfortably do tremolo or scales or any technique where you're trying to work the speed. Start where you are, gradually increase the tempo, maybe try some speed bursts. So speed bursts, just doing gradually, uh, you know, faster. So let's say I slow it way down and I might be doing something like So I'm doing a burst of quicker notes in the midst of the slow notes. Uh, that can be an excellent way uh, to sort of compare how well am I playing the fast notes versus how well am I playing the slow notes. So those would be some ideas on uh, tremolo. First of all, targeting the 152, but gradually working up the tempo, trying some speed bursts. Um, I see Tony Gunia says goal is to practice at least 30 to 45 minutes a day. And again, I would encourage you um, to, uh, you know, be a little flexible with that goal. Sometimes I like to set um, a number of days a week, like at least five days a week, I will do 30 to 45 minutes a day or whatever, um, because then it has a little flexibility. Obviously, I'm not trying to change your goal for you, but um, that's just something that sometimes I'll do with goals is build in a little flexibility, give myself a day off a week or something like that. But uh, that sounds like an awesome goal, Tony, and I wish you all the success in practicing 30 to 45 minutes a day in 2023. Awesome. Anybody else have a New Year's resolution or goal about guitar playing that you'd like to share? I'd love to hear that. Um, while you're thinking about that, uh, let me jump on a question from Cat in the Bookshelf, who I saw in the chat, and he was talking about a passage from an arrangement of, uh, of Handel's Messiah Overture. And um, so let me see if I can get my screen share to cooperate here for a second and just jump over. So here's a little excerpt of him playing this passage. All right, I'm gonna pause it there. So uh, it's definitely a tricky passage and I do admire you for tackling the overture to Handel's Messiah on guitar. That's not an easy piece. 
uh, to play on the guitar. So a couple things that I would say, uh, one is uh, when you're handling a difficult piece like this, I would encourage slowing down a bit. I would also try to work for left hand efficiency, just you know, trying not to move the left hand too much. Uh, I'm seeing kind of a lot of movement in the left hand fingers, and so I would encourage you to try to be efficient uh, with the left hand movement. Uh, now, I was going to try to share the screen with the, um, the actual excerpt of the sheet music, so let's see if I can share this, see if it'll let me blow it up just a little bit. So this is an interesting arrangement here of the Handel's Messiah. Etc. So this is uh, some tricky stuff, and uh, one of the things I would say is you could adjust the arrangement here and there. And I think Captain the Bookshelf said that he did adjust the arrangement a little bit. He also provided a little bit of the piano music here, and uh, there's definitely some things you know you could tweak. Um part you could kind of take up to third position perhaps and, and there you could take the E down an octave um. you could also take to um, to the third position so uh, in summary I think what I would say to captain the bookshelf on this passage is again slow it down seek to move your left hand as efficiently as you can and maybe in some cases you may want to adjust the arrangement um, you know looking at that original piano version and tweaking just a little bit so hopefully that helps and um, yeah so uh, yeah playing around with the E octave uh, would be good yeah reading for the piano staff is a little tricky but uh, that is something that um, you know, can be interesting to work toward. Uh, you know, obviously what I'm trying to do is keep the melody and bass going and the moving line going when I'm reading there from the piano staff. So um, yeah, hopefully those tips help Cat in the Bookshelf. I don't know if you have any other follow-ups on that passage, but uh, hopefully that is helpful. Uh, Diana says, I haven't thought of a specific goal, but finishing guitar level one of the Carnegie Hall Royal Conservatory in 12 weeks, which is basically a college semester, be able to fluently sight read any of it and have four to five pieces performance ready. That sounds like an awesome goal, Diana. Yeah, I love that. I'm a big fan of those Royal Conservatory books. And so to be able to have four or five pieces performance ready and be able to read through the rest, I think that's an excellent goal over 12 weeks. Uh, that sounds awesome. Wayne uh, says, did any classical players ever use alternate tuning? 
Second question is, did any play slide on their guitars? Happy New Year. Good question, Wayne. So yeah, absolutely. There are plenty of pieces for classical guitar with alternate tuning. Um, you know, when you go back a longer time period ago, so back to the time of Fernando Sor and uh, Francisco Tarraga and some of those players of the of the 19th century, it was mainly drop D, you know, just dropping the six string down to D. Um, you know, for example, the grand solo Fernando Sor or Capriccio Arabe by Tarraga. So there were pieces by those 19th century guitarists that did have drop D. Um, there weren't as many pieces beyond drop D in the 19th century, but certainly in the 20th century, uh, there have been all kinds of alternate tunings, especially with more recent composers for classical guitar. Uh, so one of the more extreme is the Koyan Baba by Carlo Domeniconi, where he tunes the guitar to a C-sharp minor chord. So if I remember correctly, it's C-sharp, G-sharp, C-sharp, G-sharp, C-sharp, and E. Those are the six strings from the bass down to the treble. Um, so that's one of the more extreme alternate tunings that I've seen. Uh, but also Roland Dians does a bunch of alternate tunings. Sometimes he'll do the six string drop C. Um, sometimes uh, another alternate tuning you'll see pretty often is fifth string to G, sixth string to D. Uh, some modern classical guitarists will tune the third string to F sharp to kind of match the intervals of the lute. The lute has fourth, fourth, third, fourth, fourth, whereas the modern guitar has fourth, 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 third, fourth. So to switch kind of where that third is, you can tune the third string down a half step to F sharp. Uh, so some modern classical players will do that. So yeah, absolutely alternate tunings are definitely used in the classical guitar world. Good question, Wayne. Um, I see Diana says, aren't most books about a semester length of study? You know, I think classical guitar books that are designed for a general audience aren't always thinking with the semester in mind. There are definitely some books designed specifically for a college guitar class. Um, there's a guy named Philip Hemo that wrote a classical guitar method specifically for a college guitar semester. Uh, but, I, you know, I don't know that the Royal Conservatory books are specifically thinking a semester, although those are probably designed in that direction. Uh, but some of the other books that are out there, uh, maybe like the Node anthologies or some of those things. I don't know they're necessarily designed for a semester, but I think certainly thinking of a semester as a time frame for setting your goal, I think is a, a good idea. I like that. Cat in the Bookshelf says, I will try it. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Uh, RNT says, hi, Sean. And RNT, it is great to see you. Happy New Year uh, to you and to everybody else uh, who has tuned in here. Uh, so if there are other questions, do let me know in the chat. Um, by the way, Jonathan Laird let me know about an interesting new video that's out. It just came out uh, on the Sickest Guitars channel here on YouTube, which if you're not familiar with that channel, they've got all, all kinds of great you know, videos of fantastic classical guitarists on there. But there's a new video by Anna Vitovich where she plays the Aranjuez Concerto by Rodrigo, but on solo guitar, which is not something you see very often. So uh, let me uh, play just a snippet of that video. Um, that is pretty interesting. So let me get over to that really quick if I can in the screen share. And let's see if we can just check a little bit of this out. Again, I just haven't seen too many people that attempt the Aranjuez Concerto as a solo piece. So that's pretty cool. Uh, let me fast forward just a little bit and give you another snippet. <laughs> Anavitovich, of course, is just a fantastic player. Uh, lots of great videos of her on YouTube, but this is the first time I've seen this one, so I appreciate Jonathan uh, mentioning this. So anyway, it's a brand new video. 
If you haven't seen that video yet, you may want to check that one out. Um, that's just a fun thing that you don't see every day to have the uh, Ron Wes Concerto on a single classical guitar. So um, I see Cat in the Bookshelf says, actually, my left hand jumping too high in the short video was done purposely for relaxing a little bit the hand and trying to memorize movements, exaggerating them. Um, yeah, that's, that's an interesting thought. And let me respond to that just a little bit, uh, Captain the Bookshelf. When you're saying, you know, jumping the hand higher as a way to relax the hand, one of the things I've talked about a little bit before is when I think of lifting the fingers, um, you know, sometimes we feel like, hey, to keep the fingers in close, I have to tense my hand. In other words, to relax the hand, my fingers are gonna go further away from the neck. And I think it depends. I think sometimes we have a habit of lifting our fingers away from the neck, but um, you know, if we can relax the extensors on the back of the hand, um, actually, you know, our fingers can stay close into the fretboard. So when I, when I talk about staying close into the fretboard for efficiency, I'm not trying to create more tension. I'm not trying to stop you from relaxing. I'm saying, let's relax the extensors on the back of the hand instead of tensing the flexors. You know, so um, a lot of times we're trying to draw the hand in, we're tensing the flexors instead of relaxing the extensors, relaxing the back of the hand. Um, and I see Tony Gunia says, uh, could you provide a link to that on a Vitovich video? So yeah, let me just real quick uh, drop a link to the Anna Vitovich video here in the chat. And so there is that. So again, super fun video. And I see RNT says, Se second movement has one of the greatest melodies of all time. Yeah, absolutely. That slow movement of the Ron Huez Concerto is just a haunting, beautiful melody. It's one of the few melodies where other people on other instruments have arranged it. You know, um, Chick Corea has, uh, has taken it and played it, uh, and other musicians have taken that and played that melody from Ron Huez. And a lot of times guitarists are arranging music from other instruments, but it's really cool to have um, a melody like the Aranjuez Concerto Second Movement that was written for guitar, but then gets arranged for other instruments. Um, and then I also see uh, Polly's Guitar Chan Journal says, hey, I made it live. So yeah, Polly, it's great to see you. Glad you were able to uh, tune in here. Uh, so as you guys have questions or topics you want me to cover, uh, do let me know. Another question I got in advance was from Gord, are all six strings adjusted to the exact same height or should certain strings be higher or lower than others? Can I do the measuring with an automotive spark plug gapping gauge? Uh, otherwise my measurements not, might not be very accurate. So uh, when you're measuring the action, you'd measure at the 12th fret, generally from the top of the fret to the bottom of the string. And uh, yeah, the sixth string is gonna be higher than the first string. The sixth string bass versus the first string treble, uh, sixth string is gonna be higher. Typically the sixth string, it's about four millimeters above the top of the fret, whereas the first string would be about three millimeters above the top of the fret. Uh, now you could do this with a ruler, but probably wouldn't be very accurate. So yeah, I'm not familiar with a gapping gauge, but my guess it's sort of like a micrometer, a little gauge that you can adjust. And so yeah, having a micrometer or a gapping gauge or something that's a very precise measurement um, would be good. But yeah, about four millimeters of the base, three millimeters of the treble would be what I'd aim for on the action for a classical guitar. And uh, you know, if you're not an expert in guitar setup, might be good to have a guitar repair person or a luthier uh, do that setup for you uh, to make sure that it is optimal. I see Wayne says, crazy question. Is our Savarez strings out of France still in business? I can't seem to find them anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. I use Savarez myself. Um, I'm a fan of Savarez. These are Savarez Corum uh, bases and Alliance Trebles. Uh, so the Corum Bases Alliance Trebles are both made by Savarez out of France. The place I buy them is stringsbymail.com. I'll uh, put that in the chat. Stringsbymail.com. Uh, you can find Savarez and 50 other brands of strings, I think. I mean, they've got tons and tons of strings on that website. But um, yeah, I, I definitely, you can still buy Savarez, and those are the strings that I personally use. Uh, so good question uh, from Wayne. Um, another question that I got in advance was, uh, if I want to progress quickly and efficiently, should I hire a teacher? Uh, yeah, I would say so. 
I mean, if you want to progress as efficiently as possible, hiring a private teacher, uh, whether that's in person, whether that's online, is a good idea. Um, and uh, the follow-up question was, if there are no teachers near me, should I try to learn the guitar online via Skype or FaceTime or Zoom or something? Yeah, absolutely. So I, for example, teach guitar lessons in my local area, but I also teach guitar lessons through Zoom. And so uh, absolutely, you can definitely take lessons online or locally. And I think if you are not making much progress in your playing, then uh, getting a teacher is a good idea. And even if you are making progress, a teacher can accelerate that progress. Uh, a teacher can help you eliminate trial and error and just kind of tell you this is the next thing you need to work on um, so that you can progress that much more quickly. Another follow-up uh, question on that was, should I conduct an interview of the teacher? How do I know if I'm hiring a competent teacher? Well, I think one of the places to start is you can just look at videos that that teacher has put out uh, online, whether on YouTube or Instagram or wherever. You know, what is that teacher's playing like? What is their teaching like? If they have videos that they're playing and teaching out on social media or out on the internet, that's a great place to start in evaluating them. And then, yeah, definitely I think having kind of an initial uh, first lesson to just try it out. Um, you know, instead of committing to a month or three months or something, just like, hey, can I have a first lesson? Some teachers will even give you a first lesson free, but even if you need to pay for the first lesson, totally understandable, you're paying for that person's time. But just have a first lesson, kind of test it out. You know, maybe ask them a few questions, uh, like what do they focus on in teaching? Is it all about their goals? I mean, you want a teacher that has specific things they think you need to learn, but are they also willing to work with your goals and kind of tailor the lessons to helping you achieve what you want to achieve? Um, it's also interesting to kind of ask a prospective teacher about their students. What have your students achieved? And I don't just mean like, you know, are their students the greatest virtuosos in the world, but have their stu students made meaningful progress? Uh, would the teacher be willing to give you the email addresses of a couple of their students? Obviously with that person's permission, you know, with the student's permission, but would the teacher be able to put you in touch with a couple of their current or former students who could talk about, hey, I made this much progress when I was studying with them. So those would be some ideas and yeah, you know, trying out a free lesson is a good idea. If somebody offers you a free lesson, um, you know, that can help you know if it's a, a good fit or even just a, a paid first lesson uh, to try it out and test it. Um, also, I see um, Diana says, my cat lately interrupts my practice, especially when I'm working on something I don't have musically down yet or something he is unfamiliar with. He doesn't do that with familiar pieces to him. How do I handle that? Also, in the middle of green sleeves, he meows. Is this his way of cheering or applauding? Well, I'm going to go with the positive and say that it is your cat's way of cheering or applauding, uh, that your cat wants to get in on the music making and duet. Um, you know, I don't honestly know why the cat is doing that. I'll offer a couple of comments. One is, it reminds me of years ago, I went and I was staying with a couple of friends. I was auditioning at Peabody Conservatory in Baltimore, and I was staying with a couple of friends in the Baltimore area, and they had a large Rottweiler. And I started practicing a piece that had a lot of you know, sort of Roscato style strumming. <laughs> You know, a lot of that sort of stuff. It was a Joaquin Torina piece, and uh, I don't have the piece by memory anymore. But anyway, it had a lot of strumming. It was the uh, uh, Garotin e Soleares by, uh, by Torina. And uh, anyway, the Rottweiler started growling. When I would do the Roscalas and strums, this is, you know, like 110 pound Rottweilers, like, Rrr. and I looked at my friend. I was like, what do I do? He said, oh, start playing Bach. And uh, my friend was a bowed string player and played a lot of Bach around the Rottweiler. So Rottweiler was very used to that. So I started playing Bach. The Rottweiler just settled right down and closed his eyes. I was like, you have got to be kidding me. So it definitely made me aware that animals are sensitive to different types of music and they can react in different ways. So my friend just kind of put the Rottweiler in another room whenever I needed to practice the Roscianos. But if I was practicing Bach, it'd be totally fine to do it with the Rottweiler in the room. So if your cat is getting really um, agitated at the uh, unfamiliar pieces, you might want to just kind of lock your cat out of the room where you are for a few minutes while you do the unfamiliar piece. And then the piece that the cat seems to like that's more familiar, maybe let the cat back in the room. Uh, but it is interesting how animals do react uh, to music. Uh, RNT says, I had a convo about competitions with another guitarist, and he said one of the most relatable jokes, don't you hate it when you're in a competition 
and the other competitors are better than you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, competitions are one of those things that uh, are really useful because they challenge guitarists to grow, but they also can be really unhealthy for certain guitarists if you let it um, get to your head, so to speak. So um, I struggle with this. I competed in competitions for several years and I won a few. I, um, you know, got prizes in a few. And then there were others where I didn't even make it past the first round. And, you know, it definitely could mess with you if you had a bad performance in the competition or even if you thought you played well, but you didn't advance to the next round or whatever. Um, or, you know, just like you said, looking in the other competitors are better than you. Uh, it was tough. But the mindset that I think is best on competitions, I think I may have heard this from Dennis Azabagic, who's ridiculously good and won a whole bunch of competitions uh, over the years. But Dennis Azabagic said, you want to compete with yourself. And the only question you should be asking if you play in a competition is, did I play better than I played a week ago, better than I played a month ago? And if you play in a competition and you're playing the best you've ever played, then you won. You might not have won the competition, but you won the reason for entering a competition. So if you keep making new personal bests, then sooner or later, you will be one of the prize winners. You will be um, you know, in the running for the competition. Uh, but don't just let the first competition you enter get you down. Uh, just ask yourself, am I continuing to improve? Am I beating my playing from yesterday? And that's really the best question to ask in competition. And even if you're not doing competitions, that's still the question to ask. The question to ask is not, am I better than John Williams? Am I better than Anna Vitovich? The question to ask is, am I better than I was yesterday? Am I better than I was last week or last month? And actually, I sometimes like, am I better than I was last month? Better than I, am I better than I was yesterday? getting a little um, tongue twisted here. But in other words, what I'm saying is, if you just compare with yesterday, there's a natural up and down that happens. Sometimes like I was playing great yesterday and I can't seem to play my way out of a paper bag today. And it's just cause I'm having a bad day or something like that, let's say. But if I compare my playing today with last month, a lot of times I can see progress. Man, I could hardly play this piece last month. I'm playing it way better now. And so kind of comparing where you are, uh, you know, every month or so is good. One of the things you can do is kind of record yourself periodically and then go back, listen to a recording of yourself from a month ago or a year ago. And a lot of times when I've done that, I'm like, why was I doing that? Man, I, I'm so much better now than I was a year ago or, or whatever, or a month ago. And that's encouraging. So again, whether you're competing in official competitions or not, compete with yourself last week, last month, last year, that's the best competition. And as you continue to have new personal bests, then you may be able to compete with some of the world's best someday as you continue on that trajectory of continual growth. Um, so another comment in the uh, chat was from Cat in the Bookshelf. Uh, the most tricky part is connecting bars 43 and 44, as indicated in the piano staff, corresponding to the first two bars of the second line of the guitar manuscript. Uh, so Cat in the Bookshelf is referring back to that Handel Messiah Overture uh, that we looked at before. Let me uh, see if I can get back to the screen share for that um, really quick. And so again, measures uh, 43 to 44. So let me look at that. And then let me look at that in the guitar arrangement that you have. Yeah, absolutely. So again, I think, you know, you can do exactly what's there. One of the potential challenges is the, um, you know, kind of stretch here. You could do kind of a hinge bar there. You know, something like that. 
uh, might help. So yeah, I would suggest that rather than trying to get the two to the E, um, that might help. And I saw there was a C here and you took the C out. And that's something you can do too is, you know, if there are uh, too many notes, you know, and trying to get all the notes in is tricky, then maybe just removing a note. Or you could play that C in the bass with the first finger. That might be easier, you know, to get that note in. But uh, that would be a couple of thoughts that might help. And then I also see in the chat, Polly's Guitar Journal says, how many pieces should you have to play live? 20 minutes, 45 minutes? Uh, good question. So um, I think it depends on what your goals are. So, you know, years ago, I used to play a lot of wedding gigs and background gigs at parties, and I don't do that so much anymore. Um, but when I did that a lot, I would sometimes try to have like three hours of music under my fingers. Now that wasn't necessarily three hours of the hardest stuff I could play. Uh, some of it might be easier, you know, pieces from like the first or second grade of the Royal Conservatory series or something. But, um, you know, to be able to play for a long time at a party in the background, I'd want to have three hours of music under my fingers. Uh, whereas for a concert where I'm playing the hardest pieces that I can play, usually just an hour uh, would be enough or an hour and 10 minutes. Uh, for the typical classical guitar concert. Um, and sometimes even, you know, you'd be in a concert setting like, you know, I played at the Alexandria Guitar Festival here in Virginia years ago and doing like a half program, only doing 30 minutes. So kind of depends on the context. Um, but yeah, I would say targeting an hour is a good thing to target. But, you know, if you're not planning to play concerts or play at parties a lot or something like that, then it's kind of up to what is rewarding for you. You know, are you just playing for your family members? Are you just playing for some friends? Um, and how much music do you want to have under your fingers at a given time? But if I had to just give a blanket answer, I'd say an hour uh, would be a good target. Um, I see uh, Cat in the Bookshelf says, my goal is to improve constantly. And I think that's a great goal. I think one of the challenges is it's hard to know sometimes, and this is why I was saying like sometimes maybe recording yourself and then recording yourself a month later, you know, how can I really see if I have improved? Because sometimes it's like, my goal is to improve constantly. How do I know if I did that or not? So sometimes I try to get more specific with myself. You know, my goal is to be able to play this piece accurately at quarter equals 80, let's say. And if I can't do that now, and I can do that a week from now or a month from now, then I can see, hey, I did improve, I did make progress. And there's just, you know, there's kind of those improvements just in the moment. And then there's also the improvements that are uh, improvements in capacity, which are even more powerful. So it's like, if you've never been able to play 16th notes faster than quarter equals 80, and you get your 16th notes to quarter equals 90, that's an improvement in capacity that's gonna help you in anything you play that requires uh, playing 16th notes at a faster tempo. So um, yeah, I think measuring those improvements and noticing improvements in playing specific pieces and then also improvements in capacity, like how fast you can do something or how accurately you can do something, I think that's really useful. Uh, Diana says, in transposing a piano piece for guitar, um, to concert pitch, do you also raise the bass clef an octave? Yes, yeah, so again, the guitar is notated um, an octave higher than it sounds. So a lot of times, like if you're playing this D, which is notated as the space below the treble clef, this actually sounds like the middle line of the bass clef. So when you're playing, let's say you see a D on the middle line of the bass clef in a piano piece, well, when you play the D right here on the fourth string, you're actually playing at pitch the D uh, that is in the middle line of the bass clef. If you play the open E, then you are actually playing the E that is one ledger line below the bass clef, uh, even though, you know, typically in classical guitar music, it's notated an octave higher than that. So, um, so you can play notes from the bass clef at pitch on the guitar. Uh, what usually ends up happening with piano music is you're actually bringing the melody down an octave to kind of make it fit. Um, so like in that Handel's Messiah overture, you know, if you're playing what looks like this G on the treble clef, in other words, the G above the treble clef, 
uh, you're actually sounding the note that would be on the second line of the treble clef on the piano because uh, it sounds octaves lower. So what you've actually done in effect is you have brought this note down an octave, but if you're playing the D from the middle of the bass clef, you're playing that note at pitch. Now, of course, if you wanted to play this note at pitch and it was you know the G above the treble clef and the piano, you'd have to be playing it up here um, to truly play the octave from the piano. So a lot of times, arranging from piano, the melody gets brought down an octave while you know maybe the bass notes can still be played in the original octave from the bass clef. Uh, so interesting question. Cat uh, uh, in the Bookshelf says, thanks again. Yeah, absolutely. And Polly's Guitar Journal says, I was thinking a coffee house. So yeah, for a coffee house, 20 to 40 minutes is probably good. You know, depends on the coffee house. Uh, some coffee houses will have kind of an open mic where you can play however long you want, or sometimes they may limit you and say only up to 20 minutes, and maybe they have several different people that each kind of take a little 20 minute slot or whatever. But yeah, 20 to 40 minutes is probably great for a coffee house. And if you don't perform a lot, a coffee house is a really low stakes place to start. You know, coffee houses are great. Nursing homes is another low stakes place. I realize nursing homes may not seem like the most pleasant place to play, but you're really brightening some people's lives. So when I've played in a nursing home, some of the people that are, you know, there that just get really tired of the monotony of staring at the four walls and, you know, not having a lot of variety, they sometimes will light up when somebody comes in and plays music for them. So it can be really rewarding to go play at a nursing home, but that's a very low stakes environment to play in. So is a coffee house. Um, so those are good places to uh, play if you, you know, maybe aren't used to performing a whole lot in front of an audience. Uh, good, good thought. Um, another uh, question that I got in advance was, um, is it okay if my guitar teacher relies mostly on demonstration? Um, after three months of practicing about 10 hours a week, I'm not getting anywhere with my guitar studies. I can't play any pieces, only short exercises. Well, a couple things I would say. One is you definitely want to make progress. So if you're not making progress in your guitar lessons, then I think you should ask your teacher, um, you know, why do you think I'm not making progress? Uh, maybe in some cases they can point to areas where you did make progress that maybe you've overlooked, but maybe in other cases, uh, maybe they're really not helping you that much. And so uh, it would be helpful maybe for you to sit down with your teacher and say, you know, this is my goal. Over the next three months, I hope to accomplish this and see if your teacher can help you to make really measurable progress. If you're practicing 10 hours a week, that would seem to be enough to make some progress. And so the question would be, um, you know, to your teacher, how can I make more progress? And if you continue not to make progress with that teacher, it may be time to try another teacher. Now, as far as the teacher's only demonstrating, so in other words, maybe they just play stuff for you and they want you to imitate it, um, you should be able to ask the teacher questions and they should be able to explain things. You know, if they're just kind of like, hey, do it like this, and you say, well, hey, we're, you know, what's the right technique for my left hand? And they say, oh, just like this, just watch my hand. Um, I would not be satisfied with that. I would want a teacher who's going to explain and kind of break things down. Um, certainly demonstration and, hey, watch my hands and imitate is a good way to teach. It, it has its place. Um, you know, I kind of went through a phase in my teaching where I felt like I had to micromanage and, and explain everything. And if you watch these live streams, you know I'm an analytical person. I like to analyze. I like to break things down. And I feel that's helpful for people to learn. But um, yeah, there's certainly a place for just, hey, I'm going to play something, watch my hands and see if you can imitate what I'm doing. But that shouldn't be all that a teacher does. If they're never able to break things down or answer your questions, uh, then again, it may be time to experiment with another teacher. So a good question there. Uh, if you have other questions, uh, do drop those in the chat. Um, and one of the questions I get sometimes is, what is a good warm-up on the guitar? Well, I always like to start with just very simple exercises like P-I-M-A and A-M-I-P. Also, one, two, three, four, four, three, two, one. Uh, those types of simple exercises are really good for a warm up. I also like to play through scales. If I'm warming up, I like to do it slowly. You know, so I, I love the Segovia scale fingerings. I also do some of the Royal Conservatory guitar technique fingerings sometimes too, but, uh, but I like the Segovia fingerings for the scales and uh, playing through those slowly and just kind of going around the, you know, the circle of fifths in the order they're in. And uh, obviously I'm doing um, major scales right now, but you could also do, of course, minor scales. Um, and I like to do chord progressions along with them. That's one thing I like in the Royal Conservatory book. They'll have these one, four, five, one progressions. That's in the key of A minor or in the relative C major. You 
know, doing those chord progressions is nice. Arpeggios, you know, like I really like the Volovos Etude 1 arpeggio is really a great warm up if you do it slow. Um, I say if you do it slow because if you're playing fast, you're not really warming up. So when you're warming up, uh, kind of whatever you play, I would play slow and under tempo and relaxed. I also like slur exercises like the Segovia, you know, hammer-ons. Um, those can be good for, uh, for warming up as well, especially for warming up the left hand. Uh, you know, kind of doing sweeps or rasciados, you know. really help the the right hand to warm up um, you know Scott Tennant in his pumping nylon book has these just sweeps on just the treble strings where you go and they're just kind of like rasciados just on the treble strings those can be good to warm up or even just full rasciados it can really kind of get the whole hand moving and, and get you uh, warmed up so that can help I see that Wayne says very rewarding nursing homes and coffee houses. Yeah, absolutely. I think those can be rewarding places to play. Uh, Polly's, Guitar, Polly's Guitar Journal says, yeah, I thought about nursing homes too, but was afraid I might put them to sleep. Well, you know, I've played a lot of nursing homes and every now and then, you know, you'll have some of these nursing homes where people are in such bad shape, they're not seeming to be very responsive, but um, I've played in most of the nursing homes where I've played, people have been responsive and, you know, it, sometimes playing in a nursing home, it'll awaken a story. You know, I've had people come up to me in a nursing home and say, I remember when I heard Andre Segovia live. And for me personally, I've never, I never got to hear Segovia live. Um, I was relatively young when he passed away. I was just kind of getting into classical guitar around the time he passed away. So I never heard Segovia live in concert, but it's really cool in nursing homes hearing from people. Yeah, I heard Segovia live years ago and they reminisce about that. Or, you know, some people are like, I went to Spain and I heard, you know, Spanish style guitar playing there. And so it can be really neat to connect with people in nursing homes and just kind of see what um, memories the music brings back for them. And sometimes I'll go outside classical repertoire too. You know, sometimes I'll play like arrangements of music from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, you know, whatever I think maybe those people in the nursing home will, will remember, um, you know, music for kind of from their era. And uh, that can be a, a, a cool thing too, to again, kind of awaken the memories. Oh yeah, I remember when, you know, this song from the 50s was popular or whatever, or that I remember when this jazz standard was popular. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, 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 is it possible you could play for some people that just fall asleep? It's possible. Uh, but it's also possible you would have some people who, uh, really appreciated your playing and, and appreciated that variety. So, uh, good thought there. Well, I really appreciate you guys tuning in for the live stream today. And uh, by the way, I did a survey on the channel and I said, would people prefer live stream Q and A's? or recorded Q&As or either one. The majority of people said they would either prefer the pre-recorded Q&A or would be fine with either a pre-recorded Q&A or a live. Uh, it was only about 7% who said they really prefer the live. That surprised me a little bit because I've noticed that a lot of you guys seem to really like the lives. For the time being, I plan to be live again next Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, but I may experiment with pre-recorded Q&As here and there as well, uh, since it seems like a lot of people would either prefer those or like those equally as well as the lives. Uh, but for now, I'm not going to make any immediate changes. Just wanted to let you know it's something I'm playing around with based on that poll. But for next Monday, I plan to be live at 4 p.m. Eastern. I appreciate all of you tuning in uh, today and keep making music. I'll see you in the next one.